Good morning, everyone. I'm Sean Garvin, EPA Regional Administrator. I appreciate that you've joined us for this more, most important webinar this morning. Today's conference is an example of how technology enables us to foster knowledge transfer in an interactive setting with the convenience of sitting at our workstations. Although technology has proved beyond everyone's imagination, we are still saddled with developing remedies for many common health issues, asthma being one of them. EPA recognizes the importance of fighting asthma. That's why we dedicated the month of May as Asthma Awareness Month. But our efforts to educate our communities about the dangers of asthma do not stop at the end of the month. This webinar will engage the healthcare community in the region about the importance of understanding how environmental triggers play a significant role in asthma management. Our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Tyra Bryant-Stevens from the Children's Hospital and Dr. Kevin Osterhaus from the University of Pennsylvania bring a tremendous amount of professional and personal experience when discussing the subject of asthma management. Some of the subjects they plan to discuss today are how understanding environmental education plays a role in treating individuals with asthma, especially children. Dr. Brian Stevens will provide details on why having environmental conditions on the medical chart can determine how you treat a particular patient. Also, Dr. Osterhout will explain how practicing physicians and other healthcare professionals can use pediatric environmental health specialty units as a resource for treating children's health conditions as they relate to the environment. These opportunities for you to gather and exchange ideas and learn new methods for treating patients with asthma and other illnesses. I want to thank Dr. Brian Stevens and Dr. Osterhout for their participation in today's webinar and for all the energy and commitment they have put into the to this important health issue. I'm pleased that EPA has provided you with today's opportunity to share information, and I hope this web webinar is one of, the, of many more to come. I want to thank you all, and at this time, I want to turn the program over to Lauren Gordon. Thank you. Hello, good morning. I'm Lauren Gordon, Project Coordinator of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health in the Environment. Um, we are one of 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units um, here in the United States, and we are helping to, uh, EPA to facilitate this webinar today. I'd just like to go over a little bit of logistics about the call. Uh, everyone, your line is muted. Um, only the presenters uh, will be able to speak and be heard over the phone line. Uh, but I am monitoring uh, the chat feature here on the webinar, so if you have any questions during uh, the webinar uh, and the presentation, please do feel free to send me um, a question in the chat box, and I will be uh, writing them down. And during the question and answer period, we will go over them uh, with, the present, uh, with the presenters. Um, and uh, if it comes to the point where we are running over time, um, then we will uh, try to address your questions at a later, at a later time. Uh, so without uh, further ado, we'd like to turn over the webinar to Dr. Tyra Bryant-Stevens. I uh, will also describe what clinical decision support means and um, how it influences care and talk about how we've integrated it to our electronic health record. We will describe the asthma care system, um, describe our project, and then just show a, some of our midterm outcomes. So uh, many of you know this, but 
Um, asthma care by primary care providers has been somewhat of a challenge for many years. One study showed that over a nine-year period, visits to asthma journalists increased, where those to specialists decreased. And this was concerning because also at the same time, studies showed that care provided by specialists was more likely to be consistent with guidelines than when provided by generalists. However, there, you know, there was hope because when care providers in asthma, their outcomes approach that of the, of the specialist. So our goal at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia uh, Care Network, it was really and is really to make all of our primary care providers um, asthma specialists, that they know how to uh, manage asthma as well as the specialists in our system. Um, some of the barriers to physician adherence to practice guidelines uh, includes knowledge, and obviously we're not talking about uh, people who can't learn, but because, again, for the, of the many things that they have to know, um, it's, it's um, hard to be familiar with all the guidelines because, as you all know, it's 400 pages or more. Um, there's a lot of time needed to stay informed because the guidelines come out every 10, 5 to 10 years, uh, but in the meantime, there are many studies and asthma care is changing. Um, also, in terms of attitudes, um, I've heard many times, and the study by Michael Cabana uh, confirmed that, is that, well, specialists did these guidelines. They're not at the front line. Uh, they don't really know what we do every day. So why would I even try to implement these guidelines? Um, and there's some concern about the cost benefit. Uh, there's some concern about self-efficacy, that is, in a busy day, I don't really have time to look at any guidelines. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's lack of motivation. Um, it's too hard. I'm too busy. Um, and the concern that my patients will do what they want. So why clinical decision support? Well, we're trying to change kind of the dynamics for the primary care provider. Um, in general, it takes at least five years for guidelines to be adopted into routine practice. Um, and clinical decision support can make this easier, uh, but however, it's not always effectively integrated into care. Just to define clinical decision support system, um, this is an active, these are active knowledge system, systems which use two or more patient-specific data points to generate case-specific advice. So in this case, we're talking about asthma. And the main purpose is to assist the clinicians at the point of care, so while they're seeing the patients, to make it fairly easy to use these different data points to help them decide the best care for families. Um, and it's most likely, however, to improve outcomes if it's matched to the model of decision-making favored by clinicians and family in a particular situation. So um, here is kind of a, a descriptive, or sorry, a, a pictorial way of looking at this. There are, there's an um, electronic health record server, and there's a clinic, clinical decision support web service. Uh, both of these meet at the desktop or the electronic health record workstation. So the provider has these two major data points coming here uh, to the EHR workstation, and this is where decisions are made. What are challenges? Well, you know, you can have this um, clinical decision support system, but if there's no awareness of it or need to use it, uh, it can be ignored. Um, and also delivering adequate information to actually address the decision-making needs. Kind of the worst thing you could do is to, is to um, design a, a clinical decision support system that doesn't have enough information or the information is not right um, because then it um, causes physicians or it motivates physicians to actually ignore the CDSS. Another challenge is to effectively share knowledge. And have this knowledge based on the preferences and goals of the clinician and patient. So you really do have to kind of uh, work within your system, within your healthcare system, know the needs of the providers, know the goals of the providers and the patients. And this does vary across health conditions, decisions, and contexts. 
So um, Bates and colleagues came up with 10 commandments for effective clinical, cl clinical decision support, which I'd like to review. Well, first, the speed is everything. As you can imagine, if it takes too long to appear, it's kind of useless. And there was a study at Brigham and Women's Hospital which found if the provider actually has to flip screens a lot, it's less likely to be used. Um, you have to anticipate needs and deliver in real time. So uh, it's important to make associations between pieces of information that clinicians might miss because of the sheer volume of data. And there are also the late needs and, and when it's important to deliver the information in order that the physician would actually think about it. Uh, it needs to fit into the user's workflow, uh, bringing it at, to the user at the time of need is very important. Uh, little things can make a big difference, and so we have to make sure that we make it easy to do the right thing. Um, we want to make sure that the screen design is in a way that everything is fits into one screen and that the, uh, the user cannot ignore it. And recognize that physicians especially strongly resist stopping. So, um, for example, if you, um, if you say don't use an, uh, a medicine for otitis, then you have to give them alternatives such as education. Um, changing directions is often easier than stopping, so it's important that when you don't, uh, when you're supporting decisions and you want them to change directions that you make it easy for them. Simple interventions work best. And ask for additional information only when you really need it. So anything that's already in the database, which is influence a decision, should automatically be incorporated. And this is the likelihood of success of implementing a computerized guideline is inversely proportional to the number of extra data elements needed. Um, and this is perhaps the one of the most important, which is monitoring impact get feedback and respond. It's <coughs> unlikely that you'll get everything right the first time, uh, but it's important to start, to monitor it, to review it, to go back to the users, um, and to respond accordingly. And finally, um, make sure that you manage and maintain these knowledge-based systems so they're up to date. So we're going to talk about CDSS in the context of the Top Care Network. I thought I'd spend a minute or two just describing this. Uh, the Top Care Network has 29 primary care practices, approximately. And there are four which serve inner city disadvantaged populations in Philadelphia, primarily. Uh, within these four sites, we have 40,000 plus patients, and 20 to 25 percent of them have asthma. Within uh, the four inner city practices, we have um, designated a physician and nurse asthma champion, and we meet monthly. And in fact, uh, all of our QI projects go through this committee so that we make sure all four sites are, are uh, operating um, consistently. We do have a continuity clinic for residents in all four sites. So we try to make sure that we're all providing the same level of care. And then about 10 years ago, we um, have we uh, received or we started an electronic health record, and um, our system is EPIC. And as it was actually started in the outpatient setting, not the inpatient setting, and it was started in the four inner city primary care practices. Um, asthma has been the prototype disease, um, and through many iterations, we now have an asthma care assistant, which I will demonstrate shortly. And this is a one-stop shop for asthma information and management for physicians, nurses, and nurse practitioners. So for this particular program, our objective um, is to improve environmental education for asthma control in inner city primary care practices. As you know, uh, optimal asthma management includes um, obviously the right medications, but also environmental control uh, for triggers that would uh, cause asthma symptoms or asthma flares. Um, what we, uh, our methodology included, um, first of all, training primary care providers, and I'll describe that a little bit more. 
Um, then we created an education module in our asthma care assistant. And then we promoted utilization of, of the electronic health record. Um, we're in that process now with monitoring and feedback. So our outcomes uh, include utilization of, of the uh, EHR education module, measure at baseline six months and 12 months after it goes live, and to enroll caregivers to determine whether education changes behaviors at enrollment and 12 months post-enrollment. And I will not be talking about our caregiver outcomes today, just um, in the interest of time. So um, this is just another way of thinking about it. Um, and this is our design. I have to uh, say that, uh, in full disclosure, that when you're trying to implement anything in one practice, uh, things get in the way. And when you're trying to implement them in four practices, uh, timing really can uh, be prolonged because of different things going on. <laughs> but our design was to, over the first six months, do education for four the, the four practices and to design the, the electronic health record modification, at which point we would have a running period where providers would get used to seeing it, and then we would measure kind of the baseline use. Uh, then we went back to the providers, and we did a session where we not only reviewed um, the en environmental trigger, but showed them how to use the asthma um, care assistant new modification, and then a measuring period of we're about six months right now. So our lecture content uh, was adopted from NEPA and the National Asthma Guidelines. We use case studies, a very interactive format. And uh, we have a combined provider meetings where all four sites meet monthly. So I introduced um, the, le the lecture content at the first, um, first at the combined providers. And then I went to the practices, all four practices, two separate times, and then we ended kind of the education piece at the combined providers. Um, we talked about indoor allergens, irritants, pollutants, outdoor allergens, pollutants, avoidance and mitigation techniques, and we also talked about communication techniques for discussing violent triggers, and we focused mostly on smoking cessation, since that's a really hard thing for providers to talk about. And then we showed them and demonstrated utilization of the education module an electronic health record. Um, this is just an example of a case study we would use. So Mary Z is a 16-year-old female who has history of persistent asthma. She's here for a follow-up visit after being hospitalized. You complete her asthma.